Thank you. Uh, great talks before me. My, my name is Matt Weston. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Vermont, the Department of Neurological Sciences. I will say I have not been previously involved with the Linux Gusto Foundation, but it is great to be here and be able to give this talk. And thanks to Tracy and Scott for organizing and everyone else. I'm sure who put a lot of work into making this happen. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, a, a project um, that's a, mainly a, cl a close collaboration with another lab, uh, with Wayne Frankel's lab at Columbia University. Uh, talk about this Dynamon 1 uh, mouse model of DEE that we've been working on and try to convince you that it's a good model, I think, if we're interested in understanding some of the pathophysiology of uh, Linux Gusteau syndrome. So I'll just briefly give an introduction to what this gene does. So uh, the DNM1 gene encodes for a Dynamon 1 protein. So there are, there are three Dynamon genes in mammals, Dynamon 1, 2, and 3. And their primary role is to form vesicles. So if, you, uh, if you're a cell and you need to move cargo around the cell, or if you need to exocytose molecules or endocytose molecules, then you'll likely do this uh, with, with, with vesicles. And, and, and so dynamin is very important in vesicle formation. So to form these vesicles, in general, you start out with, I think I have a, um, they can see that, or no, they can't. I don't know. Okay, I just, yeah, I can just talk through it. Um, yes, well, I got a little cartoon of a vesicle down here, as you can see. So these vesicles are formed by um, pulling in from an existing plasma membrane and making this, um, you know, budding vesicle that is still attached to the plasma membrane with a, a small neck. And the job of dynamin then is to form multimeric structures around this neck. Um, and then it uses its GTPase activity to actually pinch off the neck and to form this mature vesicle. Um, and uh, and Dynamin 1, it's, it's one of these three. It's highly expressed in the nervous system and is important specifically for synaptic vesicle formation. So not exclusively, but it plays an important role in synaptic vesicle formation. So if you lose Dynamin function, uh, if you look at your synapses, you have synaptic vesicles that are malformed. You don't have enough of them. Uh, you get buildup of these intermediate kind of steps in endocytosis, and uh, you have synaptic dysfunction. So that's the you know, basic function of Dynamin. Uh, so in 2014, Dynamin was identified in one of these human genetic studies that looked at uh, affected children with DEE and sequenced them as well as their parents. I think they sequenced in this one about 300 uh, trios and identified uh, you know, around 100 or so genes that had de novo mutations in them that may be associated with uh, DEE. And if you look at the blow up here, you'll see DNM1 there uh, in that uh, rhombus. It's colored in yellow and all of the genes here, uh, as you can see in this hairball in the background, all of the, well, the nodes in the hairball are genes in which de novo variants were identified and the, the edges are presumed functional relationships. So, but DNM1 itself, uh, here it's, it's coded yellow because it had a presumed role in synaptic transmission, as many of these genes did. And uh, it also has a little gray circle around it because this study brought statistical evidence that DNM1 was causative for, for, for DEE. And you'll notice right there next to it, there's XTXBP1, which is another gene that's very important for uh, presynaptic function and it's also causal for DEE and uh, LGS as well. Uh, so three years later here, we, there was a nice review published in Neurology that summarized the clinical uh, phenotypes of these patients. Uh, they're, they're de novo variants, almost all of them. There, there's been a few reports after that of non-de novo variants, but pretty much de novo variants. They're thought to be dominant negative, so that means that the variant in the DNM1 gene probably just doesn't interfere with the function of that copy of the gene. So the, the patients usually will they'll have one good copy, one bad copy, but it will also interfere with the copy of the good copy's function. And that's because Diamond has to make these uh, multimeric structures around the ring of the, uh, the budding vesicle. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's a little bit unique. It is a relatively homogeneous phenotypic spectrum. So you know, I mean, I think, I'm sure as we all know, a lot of the DEE genes can cause a you know, the patients have a very a wide spectrum from, uh, you know, from severe to not very severe, but all of these patients are uh, relatively severely affected. They have early onset seizures, uh, start around six months. A lot of them have infantile spasms, uh, severe intellectual disability, and hypotonia or, or, or movement disorders. 
Uh, unfortunately, ma the majority of the cases are refractory, and uh, the authors of this study at least noted that they, it, it does frequently evolve into, into LGS. And as you can see on the right there, there's an EEG from a patient, patient with a DNM1 mutation showing the characteristics uh, slow spike wave. So DNM1 is a little bit unique in that it was actually identified as an epilepsy gene in mice before it was identified in humans. So uh, in 2010, uh, Wayne Frankel's lab, which was uh, at Jackson Laboratories at the time, now at Columbia, reported a spontaneous mutation that arose in the C57 black 6 colony at Jax at the time that caused frequent spontaneous seizures in mice. And they mapped this variant to uh, the DNM1 gene, and in particular this uh, middle domain. And you can see in the graphic here the, the, the variant they found was this A408T, the fit, which they, they named fitful. And uh, you know, since the black uh, variants there are ones that have been found in patients since then. And all of these variants, um, they, they occur in a part of the protein that encodes for either the GTPH domain, which is obviously provides the energy for that cutting step, or the middle domain, which uh, is the domain that's responsible for the oligomerization of the protein. Uh, heter heterozygous mice, they have non-lethal seizures that start around uh, or somewhere between two and three months of age, but they're otherwise relatively normal. Uh, the homozygous mice, however, are severely affected. They all die uh, around weaning age. They have a severe ataxia, um, hypotonia phenotype, and they are thought to die of lethal tonic-clonic seizures. So Wayne's lab's done a lot of work on this model over the years, um, but I'll kind of summarize the one, one study that's uh, probably most you know, germane for this talk, and that's where they asked the question, you know, what cell types are um, sufficient to give the phenotypes, the, at least the most severe c phenotypes that we see in the mice? So they were able to express the fitful variant you know, in specific subpopulations of neurons. And what, what they found was if they expressed it in inhibitory neurons, either all inhibitory neurons using this GAD2 promoter or co cortical inhibitory neurons using a DLX promoter, they were able to recapitulate the early lethality and the seizure phenotype in the mice. Uh, they could even put it specifically in subpopulations of inhibitory neurons, either parvalbumin neurons, uh, somatostatin neurons, and partially recapitulate the seizure phenotype, and you can see some example EEG traces over there on the right from the PV Cree animals or the SST uh, animals. Um, but when they put it in excitatory neurons using this EMX1 Cree promoter, the mice had normal lifespan. They didn't, did not develop the early onset seizures, um, although they did have some striking behavioral phenotypes such as hyperactivity. So this is kind of the point where my lab got involved. Um, and we wanted to address this hypothesis, which had been you know, put up to this point based on uh, Frankel Lab's work, as well as work in the De Camilli Lab on the Dynamo 1 knockouts. Um, and that is, is, is inhibitory synaptic transmission kind of preferentially affected by Dynamo. So it, it's expressed in all neurons, so, um, but it may play a specialized role in inhibitory neurons because we know it's involved in reforming these synaptic ve vesicles after they fused especially when demand for them is high, such as when a neuron is firing at a high frequency. Uh, we know these inhibitory neurons often fire at higher frequencies than the excitatory neurons, and in the Dynamin 1-3 double knockouts, they show kind of these, these buildup of these endocytic intermediates. So the hypothesis was, well, in the Dynamin mice, inter inhibitory neurons are firing a lot, then they run out of inhibitory vesicles and don't release any more GABA, and that's when you get a seizure. So, so we tested this in an in vitro system. We took neurons from these homozygous mice that are severely affected uh, in a cell culture system and did an electrophysiology assay. And what we did is record from excitatory and inhibitory neurons, always in pairs. Uh, so we recorded two neurons at a time, and the neurons were either one excitatory neuron and one inhibitory neuron, vice versa, or two excitatory neurons. So we could look at all four of these synaptic motifs, as we called them, um, and these are the most you know, common synaptic motifs that you'd find uh, in the cortex. And what we found is that indeed, you do have a selective deficit in this evoked inhibitory transmission, but you only see it when it's an inhibitory synapse onto an excitatory neuron. So even the synapses between inhibitory neurons uh, were not affected. But this was even at baseline, so this didn't require any kind of high frequency stimulation. The neurons, uh, even a single stimulation you saw a pretty big deficit in these inhibitory synapses onto excitatory neurons. 
uh, we, we went into a lot more detail on the you know, kinetics of this. We, tried to, we stimulated the neurons at high frequency and asked if they ran out of vesicles. And the answer in general was no. We could stimulate them at high frequencies and they would still release um, synaptic vesicles, but they kind of started from this lower point. Uh, although we did find if we gave them a hard stimulation at this 100 hertz that they did, uh, they weren't able to reform their, their well, their synaptic uh, efficacy did not recover like a wild type neuron did. So there is a specific effect on inhibition here. But when we looked at action potential independent release, we found that there wasn't a specific effect on uh, inhibition. So at every synapse type, whether you recorded you know, ex miniature EPSCs onto excitatory neurons, miniature EPSCs onto inhibitory neurons, all of these, you got a bigger mini, um, and, but you got a lower frequency. And we thought this made sense uh, based on uh, electron uh, microscopy work that had been done both in the fitful mice as well as in Dynamin 1 knockout mice. And if you look at the synaptic vesicles, you see there's always fewer of them, but they're bigger. So the idea here being that you have a bigger vesicle, which would contain more neurotransmitters, so when it fuses, you get a bigger response. But overall, uh, you, you, you get fewer of these because there just aren't enough synaptic vesicles to go around. Um, so that's the synaptic effects, which I think are largely in line with, 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 you know, with what we predicted from loss of function of, uh, of dynamon. Uh, but we also asked the question, and, and this is still fairly preliminary work, I would say, but um, are there non-synaptic effects of this variant? So we know that you know, dynamon is very important for synaptic vesicle recycling, but also for forming vesicles in general. And this was motivated somewhat by looking at histology of the of the mice, so if you see on the on the left there, there's a picture of a Purkinje neuron that, you know, in a wild type and a heterozygous mice, looks relatively normal. But in the bottom right there, uh, bottom right of the green panels, there's a uh, Purkinje neuron that looks pretty degenerated from a homozygous fitful mouse. Also in the in vitro system, and we cultured these neurons, wild type neurons, we can keep healthy for several weeks, but uh, neurons cultured from the uh, homozygous animals invariably would start to degenerate around after about 12 days and, and die and that's quantified there on the right with this pi staining which uh, marks damaged neurons uh, you, you might say well they're just degenerating because the animals are having seizures and you get hyperactivity but we looked pretty hard for hyperactivity in the in vitro system and really weren't able to find it so we did, you know, this panel is just showing cell attached recordings from excitatory and inhibitory neurons. We also did calcium imaging, and we were never able to find any hyper excitability, you know, just in the in vitro system. So to get the epilepsy, you probably, you, you need a network. You don't just see it with cortical neurons, even though they have reduced inhibition. And actually these excitatory neurons, as you, if you look at panel B1 there, are actually firing less um, in the mutants. So. And there's no change in the passive membrane property, so they're not firing less because they, because they can't, because they can, uh, they're just not. Um, so from this evidence, we think this degeneration is not likely due to some kind of hyperactivity uh, excitotoxicity phenotype. Um, it may still be dependent on synaptic vesicle cycling, uh, or it could be independent, we don't know. Uh, we followed up on this a little bit so far. Um, we thought, well, we should look at the inhibitory neurons specifically because we know that they are the ones that are, uh, you know, responsible for this early lethality and the seizures in the mice. So we did staining for parvalbumin expressing inhibitory neurons. And what we found, you know, was a pretty strong reduction. It, this is at P14. When the animals are starting to get sick but not, you know, uh, not terribly impaired, uh, and we found that in the homozygous mice, at least, the parvalbumin neurons are quite, quite reduced. It's a, it's a big reduction, bi bigger than 50% reduction. So uh, we also looked at somatostatin expressing neurons and pretty much found the same thing, um, like a, a two-thirds two reduction in these in the homozygous mice. And with the somatostatin neurons, there's probably a reduction even in the heterozygous mice. Um, so we think that it, it's possible that Dynamon, in addition to its synaptic role, might even be playing a role in inhibitory neuron apoptosis, but it's, like I said, there's, there's a lot of other alternative interpretations of this data, I would say, and it's something that we're very interested in. And obviously, you know, Bobby just showed work from the CHD2 mouse. They also have reduced interneurons, so it's possible that this is something that's interesting and germane to the phenotype of, L, or of LGS. Um, so in the, the, the last part of the talk, I'll just 
show you two you know, studies, one in Wayne's lab and one that we did, where you asked a question, a, a more therapeutic question. So if we reduce the levels of this bad variant, um, a, a fitful through genetic means, can we actually improve the disease phenotypes? Uh, so Wayne's lab published a study uh, last year where they used an RNA, RNAi-based therapy. Um, what they did was uh, they made an RNAi construct against the exon that fix, Fitful re resides in. They put it in an AAV. They injected this AAV into the homozygous mice um, at P0 and asked the question, do, can we improve survival of the mice? Can we improve their weight gain? And we, can we improve the epilepsy? And the answer was yes. Uh, so if you look, um, there's a survival curve there in B. The fitful mice are all dying in this study before 20 days of age, but the ones that have received uh, the RNAi gene therapy to uh, reduce the levels of the fitful variant, actually some of them survived all the way to 30 days to the end point of the study, and even the ones that died, they died a little later. Uh, weight gain is in C, and then in D you can see on the, on the left there the number of mice that had seizures. So especially by day 18, almost all the homozygous untreated mice are having seizures, but um, you know, less than half of the treated mice are having seizures. So even with a, a, a postnatal intervention here um, to, to, to knock down this bad variant, we can get some improvements in the phenotypes. Um, and then we've done a study more recently um, where we asked if we take the variant out of specific populations of neurons, can we improve the seizure phenotype? So a, a feature of these mice is that they have LOXP sites around the exon that Fitful is in. Uh, so we bred the heterozygous fitful mice with the same uh, NKX 2.1 Cree mice that, that Bobby talked about. And so what this will do is create a mouse that has, it has the fitful variant in all cells except for the somatostatin and par parvalbumin expressing interneurons. Um, and then we asked, we, we, com we compared these rescue mice to positive and negative controls. So the negative controls never have seizures. Um, our positive controls, which are in the red line, you can see they start to have seizures around nine weeks of age, and by 11 weeks, they've all had at least one seizure. And then in the green there are the rescue mice. So if you, you know, if you take out fitful just from these uh, PV and SST expressing neurons, one of 13 mice had one seizure. So uh, fairly encouraging on that front. Um, so overall conclusions and. I guess there's no discussion, but um, what I want to leave you with is that you know, DNM1 variants are, in terms of single genes that cause LGS, are relatively frequent. Uh, they do have a homogenous clinical presentation, uh, which would indicate a strong genotype-phenotype relationship. Um, so I think that you know, speaks well of this as a, an interesting uh, model to study if you want to understand LGS. Uh, these, and, and the model in the, in the mice, at least, the homozygous mice, uh, recapitulate at least some features of the human disease, including these early onset uh, seizures, uh, early lethality, ataxia, and hypotonia. And heterozygous mice also have frequent seizures, which is you know, nice for studies if you're looking for interventions. Um, there are specific effects on inhibitory synaptic transmission, um, and these inhibitory uh, effects do seem both necessary and sufficient, uh, at least for seizures. Um, you know, some caveats there. Um, but it might not just be the synaptic effects that are you know, causing some of these uh, phenotypes. It could be that just the, the neurons are, are, are dying as well. Um, but um, it, gene therapy does show some prom promise to you know, lessen the severity of the phenotypes. But you know, if the neurons are dying, we probably would want to intervene early um, before neuron health is too compromised if we want to make uh, some progress there. Uh, so that's all I have. I'll uh, thank the people in my lab that did the work. Uh, Matt McCabe was a graduate student since graduated who did uh, all the in vitro work <coughs> on the, the Dynamon mouse there, assisted by uh, Amy Shore, um, and then uh, Aaron Cullen, another graduate student in the work, and then two undergraduates, Robert O'Connor, uh, who did the staining of the interneurons in the, in the animals, as well as Zane Rusum, who's worked on the the, the rescue. And then, of course, uh, you know, Wayne's lab, like I said, Wayne has done his, his lab and with Re Rebecca Bomiel over the years has done the bulk of work on, on this model and made real progress. And he, he's been a very good collaborator in, in this project, fun to work with. And Virginia and his lab who did all the work on the, the RNAi work. And then he has another graduate student, Devin, who's helping us now, now with for further studies. So 
thanks a lot and I'll turn it over to the next person.